Okay, let's get going here. We're running a few minutes behind, but better late than never. It's the 25th today, right? Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to my studio. My name is Michael Markowski, and today we're going to be making another painting by another one of my very, very, very favorite artists. This time it is one of um, the most controversial artists in Canadian history, and um, simultaneously also one of the most successful and beloved Canadian artists in Canadian history. <laughs> so we're going to be talking about Attila Richard Lukacs, and we're going to be making um, a painting of his. And I've got an outline that I've transferred onto a canvas already. I'm going to show you exactly how to do that here. So uh, let's get let's get started here. Let, I've, uh, I was running a little bit late today because I was sitting on the couch getting ready for next or tomorrow's class which is the beginning of van gogh week vincent van gogh week and thinking like oh like this is great i got lots of time before the show begins and uh all of a sudden i look at the clock and like oh my goodness we're going live in like two minutes oh no okay so i had to run around and do all the running around stuff that happens when you're running around um but uh Everything's going to be all right. So, the outline that we're going to be doing, there's a Dropbox link in the video description below, and you'll see, look at all of the paintings that we've already done here. Mona Lisa, Whistler's Mother, Batman, Star Wars, Goya, Superman, Philip Guston we did just uh, on... When was that? Just feels like Thursday. And then uh, we also did, we also have a paint the news class, and we did a soccer player for the opening of the Olympic Games just the other day. Anyway, it also gives you an idea of some of the artists coming down the pipeline later on uh, in August. But you click on here on Attila Richard Lukacs, you'll see three different files. And where are those three different files? They are. Let's open these guys up here. Basically, there's two versions of the outline, and there's the artwork itself. So here's the painting that we're going to recreate. This is called Alex from the True North series, and there we go. And here's the outline that I did that you can download for free and use to transfer the image onto your canvas. There is also a PDF version of it, just whatever's easier for you to um, to print out on your on your computer at home anyway there's also a free and private Facebook group just for people who are painting along with me and I strongly recommend you join the group because what's so cool is people like here's May's version of the Gerald Sokoto painting we made for Father's Day um, and What's cool is every month or so I go through all of the great work that you guys have done and we talk about it and I give some feedback on it. And so if you want to participate in that, we have another one coming up in a couple of weeks. So please join the group, right? It's, it's not promoting anything really except the celebration of art and the great community we, for, we formed because there's so many great people in that group who comment on each other's paintings, offer constructive feedback and support. And also what's really neat is you see people who are, who've been painting with me for eight months to, or more, almost a year now, right? We've been doing this. Um, and, uh, and you can see their growth. And then you can also see people who are joining up every day who've just started. And uh, it's so cool because the, you can see people like, oh, I remember when I painted that painting. I was it was one of the first times I'd ever painted, and here I am now. Anyway, let's move on to Attila Richard Lukacs. 
and he is uh, almost, uh, I, I don't know why there's a confusion as to his birth date there, um, but uh, born in 1962 in Calgary, Alberta, which is also my hometown, he studied at Emily Carr University of Art, which is where I also teach now. And uh, so it's kind of interesting, you know, um, just for me, just being born and raised in the same place and having shared similar sort of experiences. Um, let me see. So he graduated in 1985 and then promptly moved to Berlin, Germany, which is really where his career took off. When he's in, in uh, Berlin, he starts making these paintings, many of which are really not uh, uh, safe for work, as they say. So uh, we may not... L let's see. If you're af easily offended by images of the male body, you might want to just close your eyes for the next, let's say, 30 seconds, one minute, and maybe I'll tell you when to open your eyes again. So these are um, some of the paintings that he's most famous for, known for. Um, images of mostly nude men, um, often in large groups together, uh, sometimes fighting, sometimes engaged in some sexually explicit positions, um, sometimes just relaxing and being together. Uh, because... If it wasn't already clear, like we're celebrating Pride uh, here in Vancouver, Vancouver Pride, and oh, I thought this would be a little bit more prominent. My, uh, let me see, where can I put that so that it maybe can I put that in my water cup? <laughs> um, so uh, Tilla Richard Lukacs is a gay painter, right, and. Uh, one of the more, and his work features uh, gay themes, gay imagery, etc. Although, you know, many of those are, are just human themes, really. Uh, but, uh, I, so we'll talk about his paintings. Uh, you know, I think the painting we're going to make today is probably the, 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 the safest painting. Also, one of the the paintings, I think, is is one of the most gorgeous images. It's a very simple painting, uh, just a, a portrait of a solitary figure, and uh, I just love the way that this image was painted. I just there's um, uh, just kind of as I said, a, a simplicity to it, and I don't mean that in a disparaging way. Negative. Obviously, I'm a huge fan of his work. I've met him several times. I've uh, I have a few photos of us together here um, at an art gallery, not doing anything. <laughs> um, but uh, um, I just there's there's some of his paintings are clearly labored over, and he's and some of them are are really big. They're like the size of a city bus. They're huge paintings. This one is much smaller, and uh, I just I I've always liked this painting, and when I was thinking about painting this artist or recreating a work by them i thought this is something that i would love to have in my own my own home because i just there's some kind of a quiet beauty to it that reminds me a lot of like renaissance portraits anyway so let's uh um let's if you're if you had your eyes closed you can open your eyes again uh okay so let's uh let's i want to play for you the, the i've already transferred the outline onto canvas so i'm just going to show you a real quick video on how to get that on to uh onto the canvas so let's see i think this is the right one. Oh, i just stopped my audio okay let's put the audio back on and So, the very first thing I do when I'm when I'm doing any of these uh, um, tracings or, or outlines is I take a, a moment just to sand the canvas down with a little bit of sandpaper. Just gets a little bit smoother surface. So let's uh, let's just jump right into this here. Uh, come on, there we are. So we I take it. Put it into onto the center of the canvas. Put a little bit of tape. I use some carbon paper to do the transfer. 
Oh. And let's just play that for a second. Take the carbon paper out, slide it underneath. And then using usually a red pencil, just because it shows up really nice on camera, but also because it helps me know what lines I've done and what lines I haven't done. And you'll see here, like some of these lines are a little off and a little goofy. It's not so important that you've done a perfect job of this. It's just that you've got the image um, roughly. Oops, come on, let's play this. The, the basic outlines there, that's all that's really important here. Uh, right? Once you're done, it's a good idea just to check and make sure all the lines the, are have indeed been traced. You don't have to do all the lines. You'll see I didn't do all the little tiny lines on the face. And then you can save your carbon paper for later. Okay. So, let's get to this here. Cleaning up as we go. Cleaning up as we go. So I save these. I like to use these for... Um, you can use them to paint on. You can do a watercolor version of them. Or you can give them to a small child in your family who might want to color over top of them. Why not, right? Or in, you could also use it to make many, many copies of this painting if you wanted. Ah, okay. So let's get out some paints. I'm going to use my... Oh, we got a nice pride-themed palette, right? Our primary colors are really right out of the, the rainbow and the pride flag, so that's kind of nice. And I'm going to use probably most of these colors in the painting, even though the actual painting itself is... Um, uh, a little bit subdued in the color palette. As always, I'm going to put some warm yellow down as a uh, as a wash, just to get the painting started. So let's. I'm going to get a big brush. Let's get. A little bit of water on there. Just got a little bit on the canvas. That's okay. We're going to paint this whole thing in a second. This is the only time I put water on my palette. And just kind of blend in some of that pigment. I keep meaning to use some acrylic medium as opposed to water because technically putting... Um, water in your acrylics is not the is not great because you clean your brush with water, right? And too much water essentially destroys the acrylic paint and can prevent it from bonding properly to the canvas. So, I mean that's something that you know if you were a curator you'd be really or a collector, you know, you want your painting to to last forever, ideally, right? So you want to to as a as a craftsperson to be using the best possible materials and the best possible techniques to ensure that it uh, will stand the test of time. A kind of funny, quick story about all of that is. Vincent, or no, uh, Pablo Picasso infamously would use um, really good materials for paintings he intended to keep or give to his family versus the paintings that he made uh, on commission or to give away or that he sold, especially to people he wasn't particularly a fan of. Um... He would use like the worst materials possible and paint them in a way that could deliberately cause them to fall apart after a period of time, which I think is like really funny. Like, uh, there's a, a lot of artists are, um, 
have a bit of a mischievous streak, and Picasso was certainly um, one of the more mischievous artists. People could also say a lot worse about Picasso, but at the very least, he was a mischievous person. Um, okay. Maybe that's going to be in the way. Let's put that next to the... Okay. So, we've got a nice quick... Uh, foundation of color on here and I think that's actually gonna gonna be nice when we especially when we look at this painting or let's uh, let's put this here okay so we got our outline there and then here's the the image it already has a bit of this warm um, hue kind of lurking in in all of these colors right even if you look at the I mean, let's just zoom in and take a kind of a quick look. Right, we can see that even though this is a black on his shirt, or actually it's even maybe like a dark, dark green, or there's some dark green and purple in here perhaps, um, that there's color underneath there as well. And again, even though this is, uh, we've got this um, kind of eggshell white back here, there's some color radiating through all that. And then, of course, the face has lots of colors. Lots of different colors in here. Okay. So, um, let's... I think this needs just a, a little bit of, of a quick blow dry to speed up this process. <laughs> I meant to do the other one first. Turn off the hair dryer and then unmute the microphone, and I did the exact opposite. Ooh, it is. It's hot in the studio today. My goodness. Just when you think we're done with all of the heat here in Vancouver, it's uh, heated up again. Okay, so we've got uh, our foundation on here. Let's now put some paint on the palette and get to work. That's a lot of yellow. I usually say, put as much paint on your palette as you put on your toothbrush. And um, that's uh, uh, like a elephant-sized amount of toothpaste. I, I guess elephant have teeth, right? They how, That's how they would eat all of that um leaves and stuff right they have they must have some kind of teeth i've never thought about what goes on inside the mouth of an elephant until just now um it is worth just mentioning that uh since i just brought up animals that attila richard lukacs uh hasn't always painted male figures he's uh, he's actually done a whole series of paintings of monkeys and I th I'm trying to think what other animal, like I think some birds, but mostly monkeys. And I did, I was thinking about maybe doing one of his monkey paintings, but I, uh, I couldn't find an image of high enough resolution. I ordered some things off the library, but they haven't arrived, so... But uh, this is, I think, my preferred painting anyway. And probably if you were to... Uh, be the, certainly much more iconic Attil Attila Richard Lukacs painting than uh, a monkey painting. I think that a little bit more of a deeper cut 
of a, of an image, right? So some people are like, oh, that's kind of a cool painting. Who's it by? Lukacs. Interesting. I would not have uh, thought that. Uh, this one, however, I'm, I'm sure there will be no mistaking that it is one of his. Uh, it's also really from the high point of his career. These these paintings made in 1995. This painting made in 1995 was shortly before he he moved from uh, Germany back to North America, and he moved to New York City, and. Pretty much, I, I'm not. I don't know the the entire biography. I have never asked him about this, but at around that period of time when he moved to New York, is he got addicted to uh, meth, methamphetamine, this drug that is like a horrible drug that is you know you, you may or may not even know some people in your family who've been affected by by that monster of a horrible, um, horrible drug. But he got in. He got into that. And there's a great documentary. Maybe while I just take a second here, um, it's called "Drawing Out the Demons." It's I've seen it. It's on actually. It's on YouTube. Let me see if I can find it. At least it was. I, this is how I saw this video. Yeah, here it is. Or it was on you. It's probably been taken down, um, but. I, if you uh, if you're looking to see a video of a great artist really struggling with addiction, and you can see the whole kind of decline, and if I recall at the end there it is quite hopeful because he manages um, to find some uh, recovery and turns his life back around. And when I've I, I met him when he came to my art school because I went to the Alberta College of Art uh, for a period of time in Calgary and he, he did a, a, a lecture there or talked there I think actually would have been around the late 90s is when he came to the school uh, my memory <laughs> 25 years ago is a little foggy but uh, he came to the school around then and then I subsequently met him a few times at his exhibitions here in Vancouver uh, over the past few years. Anyway, great documentary. Strongly recommend it because um, it's it it's it's also quite heartbreaking if, just seeing somebody really struggling like that. Uh, somebody that I have a great deal of respect for. So let's think about how we want to make today's painting. So we've got um, this central figure in the foreground, and we're going to try to primarily paint that figure mostly with warm colors, right? So like warm skin tones, warm uh, dark colors, warm white, etc. And that's really push that figure forward. Then we have this background that looks like it could be some kind of brick or like a concrete. And he, he's pretty much like right, it looks like he's right up against that, that brick wall, which is why we have this uh, could be a shadow kind of right over his shoulder. And you really only would have a shadow like that if you were quite close to the wall. So even though they're very in similar kinds of places, you know, literally right next to one another, we do, you could say we have a foreground and a background. I mean, we, we literally do, but in terms of just space, uh, the space is quite compressed in this image. And so I'm still going to recommend we paint that background with a cool color. So let's mix kind of a cool, kind of a brown, but it's gonna look a little bit more like of an eggshell color. Now we could mix a gray just by using black and white, right? That's the simplest way to, um, to, to create a gray. And then if we did that, we could just maybe add a little bit of yellow, maybe a little bit of blue and a little bit of red to kind of give it a little bit more color so it's not just a plain gray but it has a little bit of life so we could do that the thing is basically that's just the same formula for for making uh our own gray right so let's put a little bit of white on here there's a lot of white these tubes um i don't know it's not the best designed type of thing because I always find they get really gummy and paint builds up there anyway. 
So let's mix a, 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 a very light, cold brown or in gray, I guess. So to do that, I'm going to use my cold colors, right? And we're going to make it primarily yellow and well, well mostly white, but mostly kind of a, a, a anyway, let's just enough talking. Let's just do this. Uh, so let's put some yellow here. In fact, that might be, well, we'll see. Let's take a bit of red and you can see when I'm talking about a little bit, I mean a little bit. And then on the other side of my brush, I'm going to take a little bit of blue. I'm just going to rub all of this together. Maybe just a bit more red in there. So, I mean, there's most of the paint is now in my brush, right? So, in fact, I'm just going to take a second before I move on. Let's just wipe all that excess paint off. I'm not going to wash it off, but now I have most... I'm just going to add white to the color that's here. So, that's actually pretty much bang on, but now that I do that, I'm thinking, you know what, I probably should have made a little bit more of that color. So, because we got a lot here. So I'm just going to put a bunch of white on, and then let's just sort of do that a little bit again here. So take some white, much less blue, much, a little bit more red. Okay, mix that together, mix the white into it. And then you can you often see me doing this with my brush, squeezing out the paint. Now this is really, you know, we talked about uh, palette knives um, a few classes ago when we did the Marcel Ferrand. That would, this is why you'd want to have a palette knife, or, or that's, that's reasons why people use a palette knife. Obviously you see me very rarely using a palette knife. I think that's, this is good, but it's a little bit, I think I want a little bit more warmth to it. Maybe, let's add a bit more yellow and even a bit more red. Let's go even a little bit more yellow. Okay. There we go. And I got lots of paint still kind of hidden in this brush. So squeeze a bit of that out. Okay, now we're ready to go. Now, just to, we are probably going to lose a little bit of these lines. I'm not too concerned with losing these lines because it's not they're not overly significant to, to to the success or failure of this painting. If you were really afraid of losing these lines, you could take, like, say, a blue and just quickly go over those lines. They might show a little bit through this layer of white that I'm putting down here right now. And then I'm just applying this, obviously, very liberally over the surface here. When in doubt, I'll go over top of my pencil lines, like on the face there, as you see. So, I still see some of those lines. I might, I might paint, well, we'll see how opaque this dries. There's a lot of white in this color, like it's, 90% white, if not more. So it's going to cover up whatever's underneath there really well. But, you know, I might just leave it like this. So I'm just going to go in fine-tune just a little bit. As I said, I'm, I, I'd rather go over top of these lines a bit than have a little gap. It, for this style of painting, right? Not 
it, that's not a, a universal approach to painting. It's just for this particular style of painting, I think we want to cover, we want to have kind of this unified surface where there isn't really gaps between the different colors. And I, I really want to make sure that's clear because there's many, many different, there's infinite ways of making a painting. And through these classes, my goal is to try to present with you as many different uh, approaches to painting as I can so that you have a good idea of how a, a painting can be made in, in all sorts of different sort of approaches. Like, one of the things I hear all the time, like, in when I'm teaching painting, um, whether it's teaching introductory painting to people who've never painted before, even little kids, because um, I've gone into schools across uh, Vancouver and Los Angeles, where I used to live, um, as well as teaching seniors, and I also teach at, as I said, Emily Carr University here in Vancouver, and almost universally I always hear people asking me is it okay if I do dot 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 is it okay if I make this darker is it okay if I paint this bigger is it okay if I use red here instead of blue you know I, I honestly think a big part of being an art teacher is just giving people permission to do what they really want to do um, sometimes people want permission sometimes people aren't sure if it will work and they're looking for maybe some expertise and um but often it's just like they're like oh you know it would be it would be so cool if i did this and that but i i guess it's probably that would be really wrong right is it okay if i do that anyway so that's that's i think that's good for our background for this initial step here uh, obviously that paint is going to take a little bit of time to dry so we'll just let it dry while it's drying, we'll move on to other parts of the figure here. Now we do have all of this black. That black is gonna be something we do at the very, very end. Including even, there's some black in the background, but it's not solid black. And in fact, I think I'm gonna to try to avoid using black as much as possible in this painting and just try to mix really dark colors that are primarily cold for the background and warm for the foreground. Okay, so what should we do next? I guess let's, for the face, another thing when it comes, just like I, the advice I gave for the background of painting these lines in first, I would suggest we do that for the face as well. That's just something I've, I've picked up teaching like beginner painters um, or people who are coming back to painting is you know, my, my instinct as an artist who's been painting professionally for 25 years almost is I would have no concern going into this painting, mixing colors right now, and starting to paint elements of the face. In fact, probably if I was painting this on my own and not on camera, I would probably just paint this whole thing one color. I'd, I'd put a, uh, what you call like a local color, a skin tone, um, that in fact the color I'd probably paint if I could slit would be a bit of this a bit of a pinkish color that we see a few places in here so that would be the, I would just paint that right over the face boom and I'd be done then I'd start kind of getting a little bit more detailed and, and sort of painting uh, some shapes onto the face not not shapes as in eyes but shapes of shadows on here and if I was to do that I bet you I could finish this painting within the next 45 minutes, right? But I always remember that even though I'm trying to recreate these paintings, I'm also trying to bring other people along, particularly people who might not have much experience painting at all. And if I was to do that, we would lose all the details on the face. And then people are just like, Oh my goodness, like, I don't even know, where, like, where do I put the eyes? Where does the nose go? This is a disaster. Now, now it's going to look like some space alien. Um, I would say it would be a great challenge to do that, but, and it would be a great learning experience, but again, I know that that would be off the deep end for a lot of people. So what I'm going to do instead is, is do something a little bit different. Now let's mix, let's mix actually a dark, color. I'm just thinking about what size of brush to use. 
a dark warm color. Maybe we can even use that for the jacket. Actually, let's do that. Or Yeah, let's we'll mix a color that we can use for the jacket as well as lines on the face so when we paint over parts of the face, we don't lose the details in the face. So, I want to mix a, a warm dark color. So that color I'm going to start out with, I'm going to make a, a warm blue. In fact, let's do, yeah, let's do it down here. Uh, a, a warmish, bluish, even a little bit, of, there's some green in that jacket, so maybe... Sorry, I'm just looking at the painting, trying to think. You know what? Let's make. I'm gonna make a, a a greenish color like this. Maybe make it a little bit darker. I don't know if this is exactly how he made his painting, but from just my experience mixing colors and everything, I this is my my suspicion. So let's. I'm gonna mix a color like this, this green, which is maybe not the most flattering color necessarily to put into a face, but I think um, there's green in all of our faces. It's just what kind of, um, how, what do we do over top of it? So I'm, I've got this warm kind of grassy green, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna paint over some of these details. In fact, let's zoom in right into the face. Okay, let's make sure that's nice and focused. And then let's go into here. A little bit too close. We need to zoom out. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and get that pointer off his nose there. Okay. So, I'm going to take this green. And I'm, I'm not trying to be perfect here. Because we're going to paint these lines in again later. These are just sort of like little placeholders for me. And if you're just starting out and you're painting portraits... This would probably be a pretty good strategy to help... Um, you preserve the details of the face, which can get lost. Um, so. Uh, Richard Attila Lukacs was, I remember when I was a kid in art school, uh, he was like seen as, as like the bad boy of Canadian art. There was like, because some of his paintings, especially back in the mid, you know, late 80s, early 90s, featured subject matter that was uh, very controversial at the time, like depicting gay men. Um, was, you know, like, not, uh, and just, it was just outrageous for some people, right? That that's not, you should be painting pretty naked girls. Like, that's, that's what real art is, according to the masters, right? And he was quite fearless as to, like, the, he was, these are people that are in his life. They're off, they were often his friends. That he was painting, and he didn't really care what what people thought, and he was and he's also painting them in a fairly um, traditional way, and therefore sort of elevating the gay male into like a a um, into 
into the company of all of these other of kings and queens and pretty naked girls. Uh, and certain people didn't like that. They're like, no, 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 you can't. Th that's that's reserved for um, for people of uh, of a that from who are not gay, essentially, right? Okay, let's back that out. Oops. Like, I'm just... As I'm painting, I'm remembering... I remember there was an exhibition of his work, which was uh, a big... A series of... Probably his most recent big paintings. It was at the... What is the name of that gallery? It was. It's on the campus of the University of Calgary... And I remember going there with my friends. We were all, you know, barely 18 at the time. And just being like, whoa, this is <laughs> wild. Like, this guy is... Um, is outrageous, right? Like, this guy is... You know, I was really into punk rock music at the time. And... A lot of his figures, you know, looked like people that I I saw at um, punk rock shows, concerts. Maybe some of them were. Maybe maybe there were models that he found, uh, he saw, and he wanted to include them in his work. Um, but uh, yeah, it just really spoke to me as just sort of being like real a real bad boy and thinking. That's so cool. Like, you can be a bad boy as an artist. Right? Like, you know, it's just like there's bad boy musicians. And not, not I don't mean just necessarily male bad boys, but just a, like a controversial, like, rock and roll, like, figure. Because my, my idea of what art is and, or was when I was a kid was, like, very conservative. Like, when I went to art school, I wanted to be a car designer. I wanted to um, design sports cars. I used to draw cars all the time. And that's when I went to art school. That was my goal. I was going to go into design. And when I got there, I took design classes and hated it. Because in design class, they would say, we want you to do this. And... Uh, and we don't really care about your opinion on anything. We want, I want this, like, to, you know, the assignment would be paint, or not even paint, it would be draw this, and it's got to be this certain size, got to be this certain color, and I and I would do basically the exact opposite of it, and I would get all these lectures from the teachers, like, you don't understand the whole design philosophy and process, uh, and I just realized, like, I have, I don't have the temperament to be a designer. Right? I'm too much of a contrarian um, to 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 like submit to um, the demands of a client. Right? Uh, I wanted to be able to explore and do things on my own. And so, very quickly, I decided I was more interested in in making art. But again, the art that I had seen when I was a kid was. My parents had all these books of Michelangelo and Leonardo and Raphael um, and um, who else? Maybe there was really those were the main artists that I that I saw as a kid growing up. So I thought that's if you were an artist, you were painting portraits of angels and uh, apostles and various people from the Bible uh, or kings and queens, and that's it. <laughs> So when I saw, when I was in art school in my first year, and I saw paintings by Richard Attila Lukacs, you know, on the walls at the University of Calgary, and they were of these, like, punk rock looking dudes, half naked, fighting each other, and they were messy and goopy and raw, and they were getting, like, uh, there was all this controversy in the newspapers. It was like, wow, this is like, that, that, this is crazy. Like, 
it just it was one of the, one of the foundational things in my own mind that that opened my eyes to the possibility of doing something that was maybe much more contemporary that also had something to do with the artist's life and uh, f involving friends and lovers and all this kind of thing and that that was just not anything that was even on my radar at all and then long story short I decided not to go into design I went into fine art and here I am <laughs> 20 years later um, okay so we've got I like this green color. It also kind of works with, he, he used a lot of kind of um, uh, military themes, like some of, he was talking also about like, you know, there was all this stuff in the news about gays in the military and don't ask, don't tell down in the United States. And many of his figures had this kind of military quality. They were wearing camouflage and they looked like soldiers that were half nude. And, um, again, other, which also caused all sorts of controversies. Maybe he hates Canada or he hates our military. He's against, you know, all, <laughs> anyway. Um, so what should be the next step here? Let's just take a, a tea break. Okay. So while that's drying, maybe I'll just go into the white here. Let's um, let's paint a. Even though we'll probably do, I might even do this again later. We'll see, but I want to have a slightly warmer white. So I'm just going to take a bit of of white, a bit of red. You can see how much I'm putting down here, like barely any. Let's put a bit of blue on here. So making a kind of a brown, a warm brown, very light, right? And I just come in here with my paintbrush, add some white to it. Actually, I'm just going to add a little bit more. Let's get a little bit more color in there, and then we can always dilute it later. I was being a little too timid here, so let's, let's be a, a bit of a bad boy here and... <laughs> and uh, yeah, that's better. Okay, I'm gonna paint this color in here. And as I said, it's it. This is the the original one that I was about to paint was um, much closer to the original. And then I just was like, you know what, let's, since we're gonna be building up layers of color elsewhere in the painting, why not just continue that in the shirt here? Because you know what kind of bugs me sometimes about uh, especially when people are painting portraits or people, is they often will give all of the love and attention to the face. And sometimes they like, really overwork the face. And then other parts of the painting are just sort of afterthoughts. They're like, oh yeah, yeah, he's wearing a t-shirt. I'll just I'll do that in 30 seconds, even though the, you know this occupies maybe more space than the face itself, right? So I always think, like, try to give love to all aspects of the painting, so that it, um, uh, there's kind of this nice balance, because sometimes, especially when you get into the faces, people really overwork the face, and then everything else just looks really under, um, underpainted. So, if we can just do two layers there on that shirt, I think that would be, that would be well worth it. In fact, I mean, I don't, th uh, well, maybe he did do that. Now that I'm looking at it, there, especially in this area, I could almost see a, another layer of color under it. Okay, so I'm going to blow dry this here because it's still a little bit wet and I'm about to put paint over there, so...
Okay. So that's now nice and dry. Let's mix a color that we can put on the face. So let's kind of clean that brush here. In fact, I'm gonna well, yeah, I'm just gonna go to a slightly larger brush to do this. So uh, to make the this kind of skin tone, let's take some warm yellow. We're gonna take some warm red as well. Mix this together. Let's mix all that. I think I'm gonna. I'm making a big batch here. Now, usually I, I recommend not making a big batch at first. Try making a smaller um, amount of paint and then mix more as needed. So let's take a bit of blue, this warm blue. So this is all going to be a warm color. We got this kind of warm brown here. Actually, I really like this color. I'm almost tempted to use this right now, but I think let's add a bit of white to it. That's pretty good. So, what we're going to do is we're going to apply this over most of the face. And then we can kind of lighten things up afterwards. Because that's what how it looks like what he's done here. So I got this. Let's just squeeze it out. There we go. Um, yeah, okay. So I'm just going to take this. In fact, let's go right over all of these lines. And you know what, I'm even gonna go into the hair too because he's got really short hair and we would see probably some of that scalp coming through. go okay I've got to stop painting on here because I'm gonna start pulling some dry paint off so should I get that surface as clean as possible Okay, I'm happy with that. So let's wipe off this excess paint. And let's see, I'm going to wash this brush because we will probably go to smaller brushes maybe from now on. We'll see, let me think about it. Okay. 
Okay. So we'll blow dry that. It's going to probably lighten it up uh, a little bit. And then we'll see how things look. I think we'll see some of our lines there a little bit. You can also see why putting those lines down was maybe helpful for this part. This, so... Um, Okay, that's great. So I'm really, really happy with where we are right now. As I as I say, if you were wanting to, to if you're painting, uh, if your goal is to ultimately paint an oil paint, this would be a great place to end off, uh, to, to switch now from acrylic into oil, because you've got a really nice foundation here, um of acrylic we've got this is basically the, the 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 we've now completed our underpainting right we've got our background color laid in we've got the basic shapes of the figure compositionally everything's locked in so now we're just going to start adding uh our we're going to bring the painting to a resolution we're going to finish it off so and you know we this took us maybe what half an hour to get to this point so that's really great you want to be you want to to get that underpainting done as quickly as possible. You don't want to be fiddling with color and details. You want to get to this place as quickly as possible. Even if these some of this stuff is not right, don't worry about it. Don't fuss over it. Just get this done. Um, like I could, I mean, one of these days, it's a little bit hard to do, but I like. I, if I, especially if I was painting a simpler painting, um, I would love to just do one where I just use all of the quote unquote wrong colors for the underpainting. Put purple here, and green on the face, and yellow on the jacket, and red on the t shirt, just to show people that it's not that it's not important. But it's not um, do or die whether they're in the right place. Because those all of the colors I put down are going to affect the final color that's on top. But um, and so it, it, it helps to, to, to get things into the right zone. But it's not uh, like it won't wreck the painting. We can always add more color on top to balance out whatever wrong or mistake that we might have made along the way. Okay. So let's look at the painting again. Now, I, I will say at this stage, I'm th I'm thinking, should I finish the background now? And then, so because we've got all of this, uh, looks almost like a dry brush or maybe even a palette knife. I'm not sure, or a sponge. Some it looks almost like he painted something and scraped it off. I'm not sure how he got that effect. It does... These sharp lines in the bottom right, that does sort of look like... Like a palette knife scraping across... I'm not sure, though. Like that white line... It could just be a dry, really dry brush. So, yeah, let's... Why don't we try to do the background now? Because then if we... If we make a mistake on the background, then we can always... Because sometimes, not even make a mistake, but 
if some of that black comes over top of the face, then we're still in, in good shape because we can just paint more of this skin color on there. So for that background, let's mix a dark, cool color. So I'm going to take my cool blue. Let's do this right here. Cool blue. A bit more cool yellow. Let's mix that together. We get a nice bright cool green. Let's then take some cool red and mix this into here. I really like this kind of cool like super dark teal color that's resulting here. And so this is a, a really nice dark color, but it's um, a little bit too bright for our purposes. So what I want to do is I want to to counteract its, its brightness by mixing a few warm colors in here that are going to sort of drag it down um, and make it a little bit darker. So putting a little bit of those warm colors in there. That's good. Let's put a bit more of the cold blue in. Look at this. Okay. It also looks like he's got a bit of white in there as well. So let's take a bit of white. Now I have to be very careful about putting too much white into a color. Because even though white, uh, you like if I wanted to make this like one of these colors, I would need five tubes of white paint to get it to there. But white does change things dramatically even just a little bit so i think that this is good it's also going to kind of work nicely as a subtle thing in the background so let's just get all that excess paint off the brush and then i'm gonna clean the brush do i want to use this brush let me think Yeah, maybe let's, yeah, I'm going to use this small brush, and we're going to do some dry brush. We have a, when, I can't remember think of the last time we used the dry brush technique. It's been a while, it's been a few months at least since we've, we've deliberately used dry brush. I'm trying to think if we did that when we were painting any of the Chinese artists. I don't think so. Even though this is kind of a, a technique that is kind of been used a lot by Asian artists. Anyway, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to get a little bit of paint on my brush here. Because the goal is we're going to have a dry brush. So we want maybe as little paint as possible. So let's just take this brush now that we've got a bit of paint on it. Um, yeah. And it's almost like I'm I'm just rubbing it off or cleaning my brush a bit. You can see I'm trying to kind of go in the direction of some of these lines. Now I've covered up a bunch of those lines. Maybe I will use a bit of a palette knife for that. The 
this will be one of the first times I've used a palette knife outside of like a, a class. So let's, I'm just going to take my palette knife and rubbing it into this color. And then maybe let's start out near the bottom down here. Right, and let's go up here. So, or let's one way to think of like, okay, well, there's um, there's another one right here. And then we got sort of two in between here, so. to his neck here. You know, maybe that was a little bit crooked, that's okay. This other one is going to be, this one also kind of goes on a bit of a diagonal here, a little bit. Uh -huh. This next one is going to come. Now obviously you can just do this with your paintbrush. I thought this would be a fun, fun way, because I think this is, might be pretty close to how he would have done his version of the painting, so... And just to, uh, all I'm doing when I, I'm just getting paint on here, I don't want big globs of paint. And then I kind of look at there and see, is there any excess? I'm gonna put one more line right up top here. I think you can say to yourself, like, you know, this isn't in the original. Does that drive me crazy or not? Eh, I don't know. It doesn't bother me. So let's just continue on to the other side. And maybe we can do white over here. I see some of my lines. Um, so I'm actually going to rotate my camp Because what I like about doing this is I have the curved edge. Which, if you saw, I could, I could really clearly see where it joined up with the head. I don't like doing this here because this is where some gobs of paint are. So let's just turn this around. I got paint on there. You can also see like I'm holding the it up with my finger. Maybe let's, uh, I'll do one more from this angle, and then I'll, I'll get the other camera, another view. Let's do that again, if you don't get it right the first time. Okay, and let's see, I've got another view. Oh, I don't, let's create it. Go the other way. 
Okay. Let's show you this here. So again, got all this paint on here. I want relatively little on the palette knife. Alright, so one's touching. All right, a little bit of paint over here on the face. Not bad, though. Not my best work, but uh, um, it's been a long time since I've done anything like this. Very different way of using a palette knife than we did just the other day, right, with Marcel Ferron. Um, do I want to? I want to do another one up top here. I think. Even though it's not in the original, I just feel some need to maybe bring a line. Out there like that. Okay. Doesn't that feel cool? It feels I love doing... Using a little bit of a different technique every once in a while. That's... it's. Um, if you don't have a palette knife, it's not... You could do this with the side of a ruler. Maybe I should have done that with one of the rulers so that you could see what that looks like. Um, great. Okay. Now, there is some big globs of paint here, so... Uh, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to blow dry those lines so that they uh, aren't going to interfere with this painting. And this is drives me as well. Can you get rid of that one? This is my OCD. <laughs> Wanting the cleanest work surface I can. Okay. It's not going to come off. i got to scrape that off the end of every episode, I clean everything down. And um, okay, so let's get the blow dryer out. We'll do that. Okay, so I just also saw there that uh, Paula sent a PayPal donation there. Thank you so much, Paula. I really appreciate your support. That's very cool. Um, if anyone else is, is also interested in making a donation, there is uh, a PayPal link in the video description below. Thank you to all those people who've supported this channel over the 
almost 15, was it 15 years? I think this would be my 15th anniversary on, on YouTube. I was one of the very early uh, adopters to YouTube. Anyway, so let's get some more paint on here. Now this right side of the painting has, um, uh, what was I going to say, is a little bit darker. So there's a few places where I, I was maybe a little quite heavier with the palette knife and so I might have a few little bit of blurring happen there you see when I'm putting my brush down I get these sort of like lines and you can see that in his right if you really don't want this type of a line like these marks then kind of start from the outside and come in So we can spend quite a while developing this. I, I don't know if he, if this was something, oops, there's a lot of blue that just got, how did I do that? Let's just wipe that off. Not that I don't like it, just. If you get in a situation like that, see if you can get a bit of water on there and quickly wipe it away. You wanna be careful you're not wiping down to the, to the, to the, the next layer of paint off of it. Ah! <laughs> maybe, maybe this is why that that side of his painting got darker and darker. Okay, so there's looks like there's still some paint on there. We're gonna have to just wash this brush off really quick. Right, so when you're using a dry brush, you you want your dry, your brush to be, no surprise, dry, right? So you want to try to get as much of the paint or water if you've washed your brush off. So I'm just going to maybe speed things up a little bit by by getting a little bit less of a dry brush. This is also kind of hard on your brushes. Doing the dry brush technique is especially if you've got your painting on canvas, it's you you can kind of take off some of the life of your brush, right? Because it's it's your the canvas can be you know have a lot of texture on it so if i was to do this i would use like one of my my brushes that i don't care much about you know sometimes we have those brushes that we've used that are falling apart and that they're they've splayed out and they're they're just, the bristles are kind of you know it's like you know, hair that hasn't been cut in a long time, all the split ends kind of thing. So, that's this is a great use for that kind of a brush.
come back on this side, which I've kind of neglected a bit. So if I if I just so what I'm doing is I'm just dipping my brush in here, and it's getting kind of tacky. This is a pretty thin uh, mixture of paint anyway. And then I go to a place where I know it needs to get darker anyway, or I could rub it off on my hand a little bit. And then I can take this brush Remember, like I was saying, this is kind of why it's maybe a good idea to do this now rather than, because if I, let's say I did the ear exactly the way I wanted it, and then now I just had to paint over a little bit, then that would drive me absolutely bonkers. I'd be kind of, ah, now I've got to do fix that. So... darker here so now I'm just taking some just a wet brush with some paint on it You know, it's this kind of thing that, like, artists, like, the fact that, you know, I you know I think until Richard Lukacs is a great artist, a great painter, if it's not clear, I mean, one of the reasons why I would have selected him, but if you're a really good artist technically, then it makes it a lot harder for people who don't like the subject matter to to say, to just dismiss you as just like um, a bad artist or whatever. Because if the if the, the underlying techniques are, are strong, then it's uh, like a, you got a built-in um, it's a really great defense. I don't know how else to kind of like another great example of an artist that the people didn't like because they didn't like the imagery but there, it was pretty hard to argue that he wasn't a great artist, is Salvador Dali. Like, people may not realize that there was a period of time where, where Dali was really one of the most hated artists around, even by, you know, he was, he was sort of kicked out of the surrealist art movement. And uh, yet it was pretty hard to, like... He wouldn't go away because people, he couldn't argue that they weren't great, well-painted paintings. Okay. So this area here keeps getting scrubbed up because the paint is still a little bit wet underneath there. So I might even go back over this. Hmm, I don't, well, I don't want to, no. I would like to just 
be able to finish this background and move on. Even though it's a little bit lighter than maybe... The, like, in the, I think there is maybe a touch of black in this background. You know what? I'm going to just quickly blow dry this. Okay, so there's very little paint that's not wet still on here. There we go. Now I can complete that. Okay, let's just see side by side. Not bad. If I want to do any more work there, I suppose I could, but I um, I do notice that he may have even used the palette knife to create a few lighter lines in here. Do I have any? This is all pretty much dried up. Or maybe. This is my original background color. Where should I put I think this one? There's a bit more, another one up here. So there's barely any of this paint still on my palette, so I'm just putting it literally right on there. And I just saw there was that little line that he did there. I love those little tiny, um, those little things. So I want—I always like to try to get that those details in my own painting. Okay. <laughs> That's just me kind of geeking out on another artist's technique there. It's probably super irrelevant to anybody else, but... I think those are the kind of things that, as an artist, when you see those, you're like, ah, it's cool. There's, I like seeing those little details. The, the, that some, you feel that somebody was looking carefully. Okay. So, at the image here, um, I think what I want to do now is I want to start putting some of the, the highlights onto the face, onto this side. And so to do that, let's we're gonna mix um, another skin tone. So it's gonna be a warm skin tone. So let's take some warm red. Let's 
Let's see, warm red, warm blue, mostly warm yellow. We're just going to mix it right here where we did our previous color, but it's dried up a lot, so. mix that together because we can also use this same color in a few minutes later on for our dark color okay so we'll take that and then let's uh, let's maybe mix this right here let's take some white in fact it's gonna wipe off all the excess on here I don't like surprises because sometimes the paint starts to build up inside the ferrule, this metal piece, and you've got a bunch of different color, and you're especially if you're doing a, a glaze, which we're about to do, and then it just sort of seeps out, and you're like, whoa, oh no, where did that come from? So here's a nice light color. Now you could paint this directly onto the face, I'm going to use a bit of glazing fluid though. This is my satin glaze or matte glaze, same thing. You can if you can also use um, gloss glaze. I always just prefer to use matte of everything and then if I want to to use a a, a glossy varnish at the very end, I would do that, but Okay, so what this does is it makes this paint much more transparent. And I, as I have said many, many times, glazing is great for the timid painter, right? It's, it's, uh, it's really great because you can take your time and you can build up layer after layer. You're, it's less of a, a big commitment to one color, right? So let's just go in here. You can also use a blending brush just to kind of blend some of this in. So we're going to go kind of quickly. Right, and then just sort of soften that up. You can also use your finger if you need to. Okay, let's go further down the face here. So depending on how thin your glaze is, it might you could this could take you five or six layers to do if it's really thin. If you've got a, uh, a glaze that's got you just barely have any fluid in there whatsoever, you it, you might be done after one pass of, of paint. Um, and there's no right or wrong way to do do this the, the more glazes you put down the more subtle of an effect you're going to have right so I'm going to keep on going onto this side even though it's in shadow because I'm going to do all of this again later on as well so I 
I see Nikos uh, Nanuris says, Good evening. Thank you for all the content you're uploading. My appreciation. My, <laughs> my, my, uh, my pleasure, Nikos. Thank you so much for saying so. Um, let's keep on going down here. So what we're seeing here is sort of reflected light, probably, from on this side of his face. So even though he's in shadow, there's usually always some light bouncing around in the shadows that are going to illuminate the, illum the dark side of the face. And that's a, this is this kind of portrait is actually easier to do. And I don't know if some of you are like struggling with this. You're like, really? Uh, but it, this is easier to do than um, than a painting where the whole or the image is fully illuminated. So, for instance, the painting we did just the other day on of uh, Nelson Mandela. If I was to think about it and to do it again, I probably would try to find a photograph where there was more shadow on one side of the face than others. In that image, his whole face was well illuminated, which is great for a photograph, but for a painting, it it it's easier to make a painting where, where there's some very distinct shadows on there because it gives you um, shapes that you can build on, right? So... It was one of those things that, as I was getting ready, for, I was like, I was starting to paint it. I was thinking, why did I choose this this photograph? It is a little bit more of a tricky one. Whereas, so this presents us with a, it's a little bit less intense, um, uh, or it's there's more intense shadows, which actually makes things a little bit easier because there's more landmarks for us to build on top. Okay, so just taking a look. Here, let's get a little bit more. So really, there's only a few places I haven't put much glaze. Maybe a little bit under the, well, even a little bit under the nose. Okay. So I'm going to blow dry this because if I start trying to glaze over top of glaze that is not dry, what's going to end up happening is I'm going to start cleaning that glaze off and it's just going to drive me crazy because I'm going to have all these patches. Oh, it's you've seen it happen before on the show where I just sometimes get very impatient. So I'm going to blow dry this. Okay, and then we'll just start this whole thing back together in. I'm going to put a little bit more glaze back on here, because sometimes it starts to dry up a bit. It's going to make it a little bit more transparent, so that's why I'm, I'm not only adding more glaze to it, but I'm adding a little bit more paint back into the glaze. Okay. So now I'm just going to go over top of this brighter area and now it's like what's the next level of brightness we want to get to so you, so maybe very little here in the shadows maybe a little bit here that might be approaching as much brightness gets on that cheek
Now I can also go over top of some things that weren't glazed and ideally they will um, just get a little bit brighter but not as bright as the areas that were glazed before, right? So I'm not entirely sure that this would have been how he would have proceeded. I think it probably pretty close, but... Can never be totally sure. I think, I'm pretty sure these are all oil paints as well. I'm pretty sure. Now, um, just for the sake of time, I might... I'm, so this gives you a good idea of, of, of the technique involved. I think I'm going to maybe do the next layer and then try to kind of move on from, from this process. But I think you, if you can see that it's just a matter of continuing and glazing and glazing and glazing and getting slowly brighter. So I'll blow dry one more time, and then I think I'm just going to go much brighter, and then, and uh, so, yeah. <laughs> we'll just do three layers of glaze, ideally. I, famous last words, right? And then ten, ten glazes from now, you're like, I thought you said three, Michael. <laughs> Okay, and then let's get a little bit more glazing. Oop, that's maybe a little too much. Go get more of the paint actually on my brush. So this layer should be much brighter. To the point where I may even add a little bit of white paint into it, but we'll see. Let's see what this looks like. I really like how subtle this is. But let's... Uh, the show on the road, folks. Now we can also, we're going to glaze a darker layer over top of this too, so you don't have to, it's not like we're going to build this entirely up 
with uh, just one side of the value scale. We're going to get darker here in just a minute. And in fact, if anything, you know, I, I think I'm looking at it and thinking, yeah, you know, I probably need to do, I'll do another layer of light glaze, but I'll do that after we've got some stronger shadows in here. It's still kind of pinkish, and we want to get get closer to white. But yeah, so just like we kind of sometimes go background, foreground. Let's let's now go the opposite direction. So let's uh, we've got this color that we had mixed earlier. Nice dark color. In fact, let's do... Uh, this might be a good just place to start doing a little glaze from here. Rather than just going right in and adding like a really dark color. Although, I'm just going to add a bit of blue in there. That blue will darken it. Maybe let's just go. For the sake of time, we'll just... Okay, so we've got this much darker color. Let's just start coming into some of the shadowy parts. We can even do a bit on the hair, even. Here, let's zoom in here. I think we've been kind of zoomed out for a while. Oh, I love doing this. 
This makes me so happy. But it's a, it's this time-consuming process. But the results, if you're willing to put the work in, are very rewarding. Okay. So I'm going to, again, I'm going to blow dry this, let it dry, and then I think I'm just going to go much darker. We'll go, like, we'll add... Mm, well, we'll still... I won't add black in there, but I'll go really dark. Okay, so let's just uh, push things along. Let's take some much more. Let's take some blue. Put this in here. Maybe even a touch of warm red. Ooh, that was a little much. So we're just gonna take even more blue. Oops, you can't see what I'm doing, can you? Yeah, let's just keep going darker, just looking at the time. It's out of focus, isn't it? I know some people will say, well, this is, this feels like way more advanced technique, or this is too, too advanced for, for a beginner class. I actually think, you know, if you were a beginner, if I was a beginner artist, I would love to know how to do some of this stuff. It, it's, it's, you know, maybe it takes a while, but I don't know how advanced it actually is. And if anything, it's, like I keep saying, it's great for, if you're a little bit afraid of putting paint down, using glazes is just like the is soup. You can just take your time. If things don't look great, you just, you can literally wipe it away with your finger. Okay. Um... Let's 
going to come back over some of the highlights with a little bit of this. Darker color. Okay, I think I, I could keep on going with glazing. What I want to do now, I think I'm going to start painting some of the, like, some lines actually on the face. And I'm going to take a bit of, a of, uh, little bit of black. And by a little bit of black, I mean a little bit of black. Like, I'll show you here. You really like we even for this whole painting probably that might be enough like that's my my thumbnail right so let's mix some of this into this color because black is just like look how instantly dominating that color is it just obliterates the colors that were there before so I'm actually going to take a bit of color. warm red and warm blue mix this into the black so that at least now we got a pretty dark brownish color and then if I want to add like a solid black later I can do that and it'll come off as kind of a nice little highlight because once you go black that's your darkest color you've already now you've set the limit for how dark things can actually get in the painting so So I have the whites of the eyes I've yet to do. I would have probably done that on my own before this, but just as uh, 
so I don't lose people because it can be a little bit tricky when you do that you might lose some of the detail and not know where these lines are supposed to go so even if we have to paint these lines a few times So kind of like what we have is like a really dark purple here to be. So. Which is, I think, like really nice contrast to some of the uh, reds, pinks that we have here. I often use purple as a, as a, um, As, as a dark color on at least on in shadows and on faces Like these are really beautiful lips that he's painted on here. Really, you know, he's a great painter. Really great painter. Very quickly. Outlining those lips. We'll come back to all that later. Um, let's even outline this face. Gonna mix a little bit of glazing flute. My paint was kind of thin that mixture I made, so it's kind of drying out a bit. Just be careful when you're using adding glaze to your color, it's gonna dilute it, and you won't have quite the same nice sharp uh, lines that you might have expected. It might go on kind of dark, but as it dries, it'll go a little bit more transparent. Whoa. My audio. Where's my window? Sorry, my uh
Where did that go? Where is it? Okay, looks like the music's playing again. That's weird. I wonder if that's happened already. <laughs> Hearing weird um, audio from the tracing process coming through. I'll just move that down just a bit so you can probably didn't see what I was doing up top there. It's going to take this darker color. Let's get some of this hair in. I think I'll, I'll I'll do another layer subsequently and kind of blend that in. It's a bit of a sharp line there, but okay. So those are our our. Oh, let's do a little bit on the neck. Might as well just finish the outlining. Second here to have a little sip of tea. And uh, Joshua chimes in. Nice to see you, Joshua. Says, hey, Michael, just dropping by to... Uh, and wow, that's a great portrait you're doing. Thanks, Joshua. That's, <laughs> I appreciate that. It also says, also FYI, the Cleveland Indians changed their names to the Cleveland Guardians. I did see that. I saw that, that news uh, a couple days ago. The Cleveland baseball team that had the the horrible racist nickname and logo of the Cleveland Indians for 100 years. So, like, I don't know how on. I mean, sure, yeah, back in the 1930s, I guess that would have been acceptable. I mean, I don't think it would ever ever been acceptable, but I. I I'm sup I, I I could even you know all the way up until the 80s before people. Uh, you know, <laughs> developed some level of consciousness of Native Americans or Indigenous people, um, but for take all the way till 2020, 2021, for a major. I can't even believe like I was saying like, you know, uh, the I don't know. I, it's, it's you don't want to legislate, but I was thinking, man. It, if Canada, it would have been great. Can you imagine if Canada wouldn't let the the Cleveland baseball team play in Canada until they change their name to something that's not incredibly offensive? But anyway, let's just <laughs> okay. Uh, but great, yes. Uh, I I I I'd love to do something related to that. The only thing is, is I'm not the biggest fan of the new logo they chose. Like. I, I think it's just a, a wing on a base. Well, I don't know. Maybe it'll just it'll grow on me. I don't. And then the name was a little bit strange at first, but I, I've come to. I, yeah, I think it'll work. Anyway, I'm gonna blow dry this, and then I'm just gonna do a little bit more glazing, which with the almost maybe the same color actually. I don't even have to lighten it up, and then we'll see where we are. Because I could imagine being pretty close to being done. Maybe doing another, like glazing with the dark, and then maybe needing a bit more white just to balance out that intense darkness. So, let's see here.
it just occurred to, just as I'm blow drying a bunch of things, let's take on a bit of white for these eyes. I'm probably going to go back in here with some white and especially this part of the eye do that darker um, later but uh, almost that might be like the very final thing I do it's weird that it's focusing like that So I'll blow dry that as well. Okay, so um, so I know that these eyes don't have quite that shape, like the, but I'm, because it really right now it looks like he's looking upwards. When I'm done, I'm gonna bring this these dark shapes down a little bit. But uh, anyway, you'll you'll see as we go here. So now I've got this dark color that I've been using for a while. And I'm going to take the glaze. Let's just mix some glaze right on here. I'm actually just going to wipe off that excess paint off of my brush. Let's get a bit more glaze. So I don't think that was on camera. So what I did is I, this is my dark color, put some glaze, mi mixed it up with my brush and then brought it over here and then added more glaze. This way, I've got a few different glazes to use. I can use this one, which has got a very, it's its like a high amount of paint to glaze. And then here I've got like more glaze to paint ratio, I guess. So that this one is gonna be much thinner. This one would be much thicker of a glaze. So, so I think I am just going to get a bit more, that's not quite dark enough, I mean, I just got to speed up here, so. going 
bit over top of that eyebrow. You also got to be careful. Sometimes your the mop brush starts to get kind of inundated with paint, and then you can end up spreading paint all over the place, and it just turns into a bit of a disaster. So now I'm going to paint over some of that white that I just put down for that eye, because this eye is kind of shrouded in shadow, right? Same thing here. Okay, I'm going to blow dry this. Let's do this again. I think I'm taking a bit of an even darker glaze. Oops, let's here.
Yeah, yeah. So I'm just gonna let's do that. Lost some lines, that's okay. Okay, should probably stop the glazing, otherwise I'm going to start pulling paint off the, the surface. But that's pretty good. Like, I think now I'm just going to... Uh, I could keep on going over and over and over and over. Um, what do I want to do? Maybe we'll do... We'll fin let's, let's do some lips. We'll finish the eyes and then maybe a... a uh, brighter glaze. So the lips, let's get a bit of warmth on these lips. Right now they're kind of cold. So we want just a bit of, um, a little bit of life on here. So let's take a warm red. I think there's a little bit of warm red and cool red in here. Just neutralize the intensity. Uh, let's take some white. Oops, a lot of this white's dry. So let's I'm gonna take just a bit of warm, uh, warm. Um, what should I call it? <laughs> warm yellow. Sorry. So we have in this mixture. Cool red, warm red mostly, like 60% warm red, 30% cool red, and then maybe 10% warm yellow. Again, we're going to glaze this. pinkish. That's probably because of the white. I could put too much white in there. So we'll let that dry. While that's drying, I'll come back to that and add a little bit of uh, just, I think, warm red over top of that. Although, you know what? This is... We might be able to use a bit of this elsewhere. Just to give just a little bit of Color. So yeah, let's move on to the eyes here while that's all that's trying. I'm gonna put some cold blue with some black.
a little bit transparent. I must have been a little bit of glaze in there. Let's do that. Get a tiny bit of white on here. Now let's go back to the this uh, glaze here. Let's take some warm red. It's too bright. So. Let's get let's get a bit of actually brown and red and glaze that together. So I'm just trying to wipe away some of the the pinkish one that I had there previously. A little better. It is a little intense, so I'll uh, I think I'm, I'm gonna have to darken this area anyway. Lost a little bit of detail in this ear. Okay, let's take some black. I'm gonna take black, go into this brown that I have. Let's come back to the black. Just take a look. And then let's see. Really, like if you're doing black lines on the face, the the best places, or really the only places you really want to think about, are in the top eyelid. Assuming the light isn't coming from below, that top eyelid, maybe the nostrils, and that might be it. Like you don't want to go too far. Maybe you could put a bit. Corners of this. That might even be a little bit dark. It's okay. 
Um, okay. So maybe right now I'm going to do the jacket and the shirt and then we'll come back and glaze a little bit lighter on the face and brighten that up a bit because it's gone progressively darker right now we need to I mean I guess I could also do more black more white and we can keep on going for a while but uh so for the shirt, I'm going to use a kind of a not too thick of a brush, and then we're going to kind of paint over this area here. I got some. That's, well, that's is that where all my black was? Um, I want this to be a bit of a purpley black, so I'm going to put some cold blue, warm, sorry, cold red, and then warm blue together. Mix it into the black. go. Let's go back up just a bit. There we are. Okay. And actually, I'm going to put a bit of, a little bit of glazing fluid. I think we need to get some more glazing fluid. Just a little bit, because I want this to be just a little bit transparent, so it's not covering up all of this green that we painted there originally. Get under this collar. Or it is a collar. I just want to make sure it, it looks like it's going behind his neck here. So, mixing a bit more. Need a bit more black. I thought I'd be able to make it through this whole painting without needing more black, but.
shoulder keeps getting higher and higher. Uh, Okay, obviously there's a few things on here. Do we have the courage just to go? So I do want to do, I, th I think I need to darken just a little bit more and also lighten a little bit. I feel like I'm so close, but so yet I still need to do a bit more there. So I'm going to blow dry some stuff because i got all this wet paint now on the bottom half of the canvas where I sometimes like to rest my arm. Let's wipe off a bunch of excess paint here. I think I'm just gonna I'm gonna glaze with this color. Oops, is it? Yeah. Actually, he's got a bit of green there, doesn't he? Ah, it doesn't matter. Does it really matter? Anyone gonna gonna be checking? Probably somebody will be. Somebody will go, ah, do I, am I that sensitive? Do I need to? Maybe I should make it green. Now that I see it there, I'm like, ah, I think it maybe should be green. But while I've got this color,
Like, I just want to keep on playing with these contrasts. Because I think it's just, it's, it's, I think it's just so interesting. All of a sudden, it, it can also change the, the look and the attitude of the person that you're painting just by putting a little glaze here and there and darkening it down. Like, in my painting, you know, one of the things with this eyebrow on... Maybe we'll even fix that because... Or it's going to be hard to so-called fix. But his eyebrows seem more... My, my eyebrows on mine seem more raised than his. And maybe more like, oh, oh, what's going on? Whereas his is maybe a little bit... Um, more stoic, I guess, maybe. Maybe a little flatter emotionally. What was I said? What did I say I wanted to do more of? Am I almost done? <laughs> um, oh, I was going to make a green for that shirt. Let's get some of the... Yikes, that's pretty intense. It needs to be a little bit more subtle than that. Although maybe even that's good. Um... rub it off with a bit of rag. Just like a very super thin greenish glaze here. You can see a bit of that on his shirt. Paint on that and just wipe. I'm obviously spending way too much attention in this little area of the painting, but 
as I said earlier, you know, sometimes we we have a habit of giving all of this attention to the face in a portrait, and then everything else is a bit of an afterthought. And I'm trying to kind of treat this area down here with some respect. Okay. I would like to finish up here in the next 10 minutes. So, I think the last thing that I want to do is maybe just a little bit bright, like a, like a, almost even a white glaze. I'll, I'll probably put a little bit of color in it. So here's some of this white that we had before. Do we have any more white on this palette? I always try to use up as much of my paint as possible because I hate throwing paint away, so. Like, look at this disgusting mess. Maybe I'll just, uh... Remember, that's what soap is and water is for, right? You make your fingers dirty, you can always just clean them right off. And by a bunch of little tiny particles fell off my fingers as I was rubbing them over top of the canvas. As if this is the first time I've ever made a painting. There's a lot of white on here. We'll see within seconds if this is a bad idea. In fact, before I just, there's like a, so much paint on my brush. I'm just gonna wipe off all that excess and then dip in here.
So as I said, I'm just trying to bring this eyebrow down just a little bit. Okay, should I just call it a day here? I feel like I want to come back here. Ah, you know what? I I could keep on fiddling with this, but I think because sometimes I forget the whole purpose of why I'm doing this is really to teach people to do portraits or anything else in the future, and I just start getting like, oh, I just want to keep on painting this painting because I'm having so much fun but uh, at some point you just got to be like ah you know what I think we got it. we got it we got it in the can here folks although as I say that I see His head is a little bit ah interesting. Okay, oh, see again, you gotta like you gotta take an extra little look right before you close things down because I think that's important. The shape of his head. Um, That helps. Like, it's funny how just that actually makes a big difference. It's super subtle little change, but... Huh.
So it actually kind of helps just like now I'm sort of painting and I'm looking at the screen them side by side rather than because so far my nose has been right over the top of this canvas and it, it can be a little bit hard to actually see this is sort of my version of just kind of stepping away a little bit from the image Yikes, yikes, what was that? How did the, why did that happen? Okay, I think I gotta call it a day because I keep things. Are, I'm I'm getting a little impatient, and I'm kind of making some big uh, big decisions with with some of these shadows, and I might be just fine. It might be sort of you know they say most accidents happen within sight of home or. Uh, not in sight of Homer, in sight of home, and then I went er. <laughs> um, most accidents happen when you're close to home and you're not really thinking about driving. You just sort of like, ah, okay, let's. What are we gonna have for dinner tonight? And your mind's not on the road. The same sort of thing in a painting. You get really excited. Oh, I'm almost done. Let's just like, ah, da da da. And then it's like, whoa. Surprise! You're not done at all. You've just created a big problem for yourself. Yeah, I actually really like that now. Now that I look at it, I'm, I'm really happy with everything. Um, okay. So, that feels really cool. I'm really excited to have made a painting based on this artist. Attila Richard uh, Lukacs is... Uh, you know, as, as I mentioned earlier, I talked earlier, he's been a huge inspiration for me. So, it's cool to... to to kind of bring it all back around to, to one of the foundational moments of my development as an artist. Thank you, everyone, for joining me for another one of these paintings. Tomorrow and all of next week, or at least Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday of next week, we are going to be focusing on one of the most famous artists to have ever lived, although, as we'll talk about 
didn't really achieve much success while he was alive, we're going to be focusing all week long on Vincent Van Gogh. So tomorrow we're going to start with probably his his biggest early hit, if you can call it that, or at least in retrospect, when we look at his work, The Potato Eaters, a bunch of people st sitting around a table together in a dark room, peasants who've been working in the field all day, the room is covered in, in soot and uh, charcoal dust. Uh, it's, it's a very famous, er well, quote-unquote early painting of his, because Van Gogh only really made paintings for about 10 years of, uh, of his, t towards the very end of his life. So we're going to begin at the beginning of his, his uh, meteoric rise to, to, um, uh, uh, to, to of ability, really. And then pr over the course of the week, we're going to be painting a couple of three other paintings of his that I think are amazing artworks. So I'm looking forward to Van Gogh week starting tomorrow. Thank you, everyone, for joining me. Thank you, Paula, for your donations during the episode. Um, if anyone else is interested, there are PayPal. There's a PayPal link below. If you want to send a check or e-transfer, contact me through the Facebook group, which I strongly suggest you join and upload your version of today's painting. I'd love to see it. And then I'd love to talk about it and show people when we do our feedback session in a couple of weeks. Thanks, everyone. We will talk to you guys in a couple of days when or tomorrow. I'm, I'm so used to, you know, anyway, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Have a good night, everybody. We'll see you soon.